Welcome to the Unitarian Church of Lincoln on this Sunday morning. My name is the Reverend Oscar Sinclair. Whoever you are, whatever your age, your skin color, whomever you love, wherever you are, whenever you are, as you watch this, know that you are welcome here and that we are so glad you are with us. It is good to be together. Each week since the beginning of the coronavirus pandemic last year, our congregation has gathered together at least twice. On Thursday night, when we tend to our community and each other directly on Zoom. And in this service on Sunday morning, broadcast on YouTube. Sunday morning, whether in person or on YouTube, is a chance to proclaim who we are and what we're about throwing open the doors of this congregation and proclaiming the radical love and welcome that is at the heart of our faith. The Unitarian Church of Lincoln, we say, aspires to be a loving community, uniting reason with spiritual exploration to transform ourselves and the world. And as spring comes this year, vaccines are distributed, and we start to think about what comes next for this church, we're considering some big questions. What are our commitments? What are we becoming? What is our story? These are questions that define us and will continue to do so in the future. And churches are generational projects. But right now we don't have to look far into the future to ask what our next steps are. In these closing months of the pandemic, as we look to the future and plan our return to this building, we gather together in hope. There is work to be done, beloveds. Let's be about it. Plighting words this morning come from the Reverend Scott Taylor, who writes, We gather as a house of stories. As we learn of those who have gone before, the way in front of us becomes more clear as we weave together the tales of who we are, our, lonely, our loneliness lessens, and the web of our oneness is revealed. As we listen deeply in those times of tender trust, we descend into longings and learnings, hopes and fears of the humanity we share. Beneath the wells from which we drink, there is a deeper well that feeds them all, Come, let us tell each other tales of our thirst. Let us drink from the stories that sustain us all. today is called Milo Imagines the World and it is written by Matt de la Pena with pictures by Christian Robinson. What begins as a slow distant glow grows and grows into a tired train that clatters down the tracks. A cool rush of wind quiets into a screech of steel and when the doors slide open Milo slips aboard. The train bucks back into motion as he and his sister squeeze onto bench seats. 
The whiskered man beside Milo has a face of concentration. A businessman has a blank, lonely face. The wedding dress woman near the far door has a face made out of light, while the dog peeking out of her handbag has no face at all. Just a long, lolling tongue. These monthly Sunday subway rides are never ending. And as usual, Milo is a shook up soda. Excitement stacked on top of worry, on top of confusion, on top of love. To keep himself from bursting, he studies the faces around him and makes pictures of their lives. At a downtown local stop, the whiskered man folds up his crossword and hurries off the train. Milo imagines him trudging through brown mounds of slush. It's a five flight climb to his cluttered apartment where he's greeted by mewling cats and burrowing rats. Parakeets tweet songs of longing as the man sips tepid soup hunched over a game of solitaire. Late that night, the door to the parakeet cage mysteriously falls open and the cats gather on the cold sill to watch the birds fly free above the city. Milo tugs his sister's sleeve and holds up his picture. But even when she turns to look, he can tell she doesn't see. She's a shook up soda too. A boy in a suit boards the train with his dad. His hair is a perfect part and there's not a single scuff on his bright white Nikes. Milo imagines the clop, clop, clop of the horse-drawn carriage that will carry him to his castle. Imagines the clink, clink, clink of the guard slowly lowering the drawbridge. Across the human-made moat, the boy is met by a butler, two maids, and a gourmet chef offering crust-free sandwich squares. Milo flips to a fresh page at a bustling midtown stop when the wedding-dressed woman strides off the train. A band of street performers launches into Here Comes the Bride, and everyone on the platform stops and cheers. Milo imagines the grand cathedral ceremony where the couple will be pronounced husband and wife. Imagines the groom whisking his new bride to an awaiting hot air balloon where the pilot loads them in with blankets and blasts the heat and up, up they go hand in hand beyond the concrete walls of the city into the infinite blue. Milo holds up this picture too, but his sister shoes him away. Can't you see I'm playing my game? He watches her thumbs bang around her smudge screen, then turns back to the boy in the suit. They lock eyes for a few seconds and suddenly it feels like the walls are closing in around Milo. The spell is broken when a crew of breakers bounds onto the train, announcing, you all ready for a show? Several curious faces look up as the beat drops and now the girls are walking up walls. They're whirling around poles, they're back flipping over shopping bags. When the train pulls into the next stop, they collect a few dollars and scramble for another car. Milo imagines them going from train to train doing their act as everyone watches. But even after the performances are over, faces still follow their every move when they walk down the electronics aisle at the department store, when they cross into the fancy neighborhood. Milo doesn't really like this picture, so he puts away his pad and turns to his reflection in the window. What do people imagine about his face? Can they see him reciting his volcano poem to the class? Can they hear his mom's soothing voice reading him a bedtime book over the phone? Can they smell the Chile Colorado bubbling in a pot in his auntie's apartment near the cemetery? Butterflies flood Milo's stomach when it's finally their stop. He follows his sister onto the cold station platform and up the stairs. Above ground, he's surprised to see the boy in the suit a few paces ahead. He's even more surprised when the boy joins the long line to pass through the metal detector. Milo's sister suddenly bends to give him a hug. I didn't mean to snap at you, she says. She takes his hand, adding, you have your picture ready? He nods, feeling the warmth of her fingers. As they slowly shuffle forward, Milo studies the boy in the suit, his dad rubbing his thin shoulders. And a thought occurs to him. Maybe you can't really know anyone just by looking at their face. Milo tries to reimagine all the pictures he made on the train. Maybe he could have done it like this instead. Or this. Or this. Milo's chest fills with excitement when he spots his mom through the crowd. 
His sister rushes to give her a hug before pulling Milo in too. And it's in this tight tangle of familiar arms that he feels most alive. When they separate, Milo flips through his pad until he finds the right picture. I made this for you, he says, holding it up. And he watches for the smile he hopes will spread across his mom's face. And that is the end of our story today. Thank you so much for joining me. Each year at the spring congregational meeting, our members vote for 10 recipients for Share the Plate. This month's Share the Plate recipient is the Child Advocacy Center. And we have Destiny Burkett here with us to share more about their work. Welcome. Hello, thank you for having me. Uh, do you want to introduce yourself and um, tell us a little bit more about the Child Advocacy Center? Sure. Uh, so, as Jean said, my name is Destiny Burkett. I am the Development Director at the Child Advocacy Center. Um, I have been in that role for nearly three years. Um, the Child Advocacy Center, we are a nonprofit, and what we do is we provide services to child victims of abuse and neglect across 17 counties in Southeast Nebraska. So our main office is in Lincoln, but we do have two satellite offices in both York and Auburn. And that is um, so that we are easier to, it's easier for our families to reach us um, that are living in those rural areas so they don't have to travel so far and so it's more convenient for them. Um, and that way we're removing any barriers for them to get the access to the services that they need. Great. Do you wanna um, tell us a little bit more about the mission and vision? I will. Yes, so we are what is called a multidisciplinary team. We work with um, law enforcement, county attorneys, health and human services, and both medical and mental health professionals in order to provide a, um, just a, a, a group of people that are all working together to address the needs of these children and their families and make sure that they have everything need, they need in order to heal and also to help support the investigation. And so our main goals are to reduce trauma, um, provide again the support to these families and foster hope and healing to them so that they can continue to move on past um, what has happened. You know, we will try to raise a little money to help further the cause um, and get the word out. That would be wonderful. Yeah, again, like I said, there's so many ways you can help out, whether it be by donating, by volunteering your time, by participating in a training or coming to an event. I mean, just the more that we can spread awareness and the knowledge of what we do and um, that we're here and that we're here to help kids and how you can help kids, um, just the better off all the children in our communities will be. Of course, and thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate thank you, you all taking the time out of your day. It means so much to us, it really does. So thank you so much for having me. If you would like to give a contribution to the Child Advocacy Center, please consider text giving. Simply text UC Lincoln space and the amount you wish to give to 73256. You may also send a check to 6300 A Street or give online through your Realm account. Thank you. Excerpts from Conflict Resolution for Holy Beings in Six Parts by Joy Harjo. Number four, I could hear the light beings as they entered every cell. Every cell is a house of the God of light, they said. I could hear the spirits who love us stomp dancing. They were dancing as if they were here. And then another level of here, and then another, until the whole earth and sky was dancing. We are dancing here, they said. There was no there. There was no I or you. There was us. There was we. There we were as if we were the music. You cannot legislate music to lockstep, nor can you legislate the spirit of the music to stop at political boundaries or poetry or art or anything that is of value or matters in this world and the next worlds. This is about getting to know each other. We will wind up back at the blues, standing on the edge of the flatted fifth, about to jump into a fierce understanding together. Number six, 
When we made it back home, back over those curved roads that wind through the city of peace, we stopped at the doorway of dusk as it opened to our homelands. We gave thanks for the story, for all parts of the story, because it was by the light of those challenges we knew ourselves. We asked for forgiveness. We laid down our burdens next to each other. As this next song plays, please feel free to use the chat box to type your name or the name of someone you would like us to hold in joy or in sorrow. Thank you for your presence. Of the minor Unitarian Universalist heresies I hold, the one that consistently gets me in the most trouble is that I'm not overly fond of the hymn Spirit of Life. This is awkward to bring up at parties, because if you were to poll a whole room of Unitarian Universalists, Carolyn McDade's words are probably the ones that they are most likely to know by heart. In the church we attended when I was a teenager, it was sung every single Sunday. Now don't get me wrong, Spirit of Life is a beautiful tune, but it is a private prayer. Spirit of Life, come unto me, sing in my heart all the stirrings of compassion. Roots hold me close, wings set me free. Spirit of Life, come to me, come to me. As a prayer, it's beautiful. It serves, I would say, as a rough analog to the 23rd Psalm in our tradition, the one that goes, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. But as liturgies for community worship, I often find myself wishing that both the 23rd Psalm and Spirit of Life had just a little bit more us in them. The most basic way to frame this critique is this. While Spirit of Life and Psalm 23 are beautiful pieces about individual spirituality, our churches are places of collective experience, where we and our are more common pronouns than me and I. And I think that's one of the things that's made this last year so excruciating for churches. Sure, yes, we have done well in providing places for spiritual experiences, for ways for our members to deepen their own practices. But there's also a sense in which, over the last 14 months, our collective experience as a community has fractured. Well, there are some moments that are shared in our community, we have been separated for a season. 
Melissa Green writing in the Atlantic this way put it in the in the Atlantic this month put it this way the pandemic has not been a single traumatic flashbulb event like the assassination of John F Kennedy or the fiery disintegration of the space shuttle Challenger or 9/11 instead it's a life period in which everybody's memories will be embedded more like the Great Depression or World War II or my high school years or when I was married to Barbara starting in March 2020 hundreds of millions of Americans began forming their own impressions of it as psychologists and anthropologists who study memory will tell you we tend to lay out our anecdotes almost like short stories or screenplays to give our lives meaning our plots do they have silver linings hopeful endings can reveal something about how we handle setbacks. We're already shaping our future pandemic narratives, the stories we tell as individuals, as communities, as societies and as nations in this time. The process of crafting these stories will help determine our resilience and well-being. How we tell our stories can transform how we move forward from hard times. As we begin this process of moving back together, a long process to be sure, but one that we are on. This I think is the place to start. What are our separate stories from this time? How will we tell them? My story is dominated by an orange wall. If we have a shared flashball moment of the pandemic, it's probably the week of March 12th of 2020. The NBA shut down first that week. Then there was a presidential address, long lines at airports, my aunt flying home from Germany. By Thursday, we had decided to close our church building. On Sunday, we met one last time at 6300A Street to worship and to try and train everyone we could on how to log on to Zoom. The beginning of the individual stories, the, the end of the flashbulb and the beginning of what comes next, I think is somewhere around Monday, March 16th. For the first three years that we were in Lincoln, Stacy and I shared an office. I mostly worked at the church, but she's continued to work remotely for her New York City based nonprofit. And when we moved in here, we set up one room of the house as an office. Nice neutral walls, a hardline ethernet connection, two windows overlooking a front yard. For the days that I was working from home, or more accurately, for the nights that I stayed up late writing sermons, I put a small desk in off to the side and out of the picture of Stacy's webcam. On March 16th, it was clear that that wasn't going to work anymore. Now, any number of folks have by choice or necessity been working shoulder to shoulder with loved ones this last year, but that was just not going to be Stacy and I. In those early days, we would both have half a dozen Zoom meetings a day and the cacophony with us sharing an office would have been intense. So I moved into our guest room. Now, in the last 14 months, you've seen a lot of this specific angle of our guest room. It's set up for video. There are lights and intentional angles, a chalice behind me, the stole Phyllis Higley made for my installation as a reminder of UCL sanctuary. Diego Rivera is back there as a nod to Michigan roots on a very tasteful, soothing blue background. But here's what the camera doesn't see from that very particular angle. Only one wall is actually blue in this room. The workstation is cobbled together 
And there's often a tripod and a bunch of lights on the desk. It's usually messy. And for a year, I've stared at this incredibly baffling orange color in front of me every single day. Why on earth did the previous owner of this house choose that color, make that choice? I don't know, but I've had a long time to think about it. There we go. So for most of us, our lives during the pandemic have been at least a little bit like this. There are always two stories, right? There's the story that we present to the world, this well-composed shot of the room, and the one that we see from our perspective, looking towards the camera, metaphorically. The pandemic has actually taken away some of the metaphor there. The selves that we present have been curated captured by the margins of a webcam or the time of a video call. But on top of that, we've been singing Spirit of Life alone for a long time now. And it's fair to worry as we start to think about what it means to see each other again, if we remember how to sing in harmony. One last story. You've heard this before, but I wonder if it will land differently now. Ten years ago, I was diagnosed and treated for lymphoma, and in the aftermath of that, it became clear whether caused by or the cause of the cancer that my immune system no longer worked particularly well. It doesn't produce antibodies. So every week on Sunday night, I administer an infusion of this medication to bolster my immune system. And sometime this week, I'll get a call from my immunologist with the results of a COVID-19 antibody test, telling us whether my immune system responded to the vaccines I've received over the last couple weeks. I tell this story again for two reasons. The first is pretty straightforward. If you're one of the people who attend our first few in-person services starting next Sunday, please don't be surprised uh, when I'm not social. The current plan, especially if we find out that I did not respond to the vaccines, is for me to stay on the chancel, masked when not preaching, and going in and out of the building through the exterior doors at the front of the sanctuary. That's not about my love and affection for any of you. That's the way that I can be healthy while we're doing this. But the more poetic reason in this time is that there is nothing as personal as our own health. And one of the realizations that the pandemic has forced is that even something so private is still caught up in community. Know that we are connected, Then Ungar wrote at the beginning of this pandemic, in ways that are terrifying and beautiful, you could hardly deny it now. Know that our lives are in one another's hands. Surely that has come clear. We are in each other's hands. Here's the last part of my story for today. This medication that I inject every Sunday that's kept me out of the hospital for the last seven years is the product of thousands of blood donations. My body does not produce antibodies, so I use other people's. In a way then, perhaps I was never quite as isolated in this, this strange orange room felt. There were always other people very literally with me. But it also means that for me, there's a good chance 
that the pandemic will not actually be over when I get vaccinated. It will be over hopefully sometime this fall when enough blood donors have been vaccinated that vials like these have COVID antibodies in them. Know that we are connected in ways that are terrifying and beautiful. Next Sunday, we will begin piloting services in our sanctuary with small groups of people, groups that will grow in the coming months as the pandemic receives, recedes. This is actually the last pre-recorded sermon I'll do, at least for a little while. And there's some bittersweetness in that. But remember, as we move into this next season, that you and everybody else has a story of these last few months. It might be a story about an orange wall. Maybe it's singing Spirit of Life in front of a laptop on Sunday morning. So be gentle with each other. To paraphrase Yeats, but we being alone have only our stories. Tread softly because you walk with each other's stories. Amen. And so we end our time together this morning and bring to a close this time of pre-recorded worship every Sunday. Next week, we'll be trying something new. Whether you are in the building or watching from home, we will be live on Sunday morning at 10 o'clock on this YouTube channel. Thank you for your presence these last months. Thank you in advance for your grace as we navigate another transition in how we worship. And thank you for being here today. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of love, or the fire of commitment. These we carry with us until in whatever form it takes, we are together again. Be at peace, beloveds, and amen. <laughs>